Well, this video is a follow-up to a video that's done a little over a week ago where I'm going to ask questions that were submitted about the previous video. With the red and blue chart of metabolic pathways, you imply MECFS is not like conventional mitochondrial disease, but more like a supply problem. Is that right? Like, if the mitochondria are a factory, it's the factory itself which is broken, and unusable fuel piles up outside, whereas in MECFS, the factory itself is in working order, but it's just not getting any fuel supplies delivered. Have I understood that right? Yeah, I think that's a really good analogy, what's going on in this disease. Uh, it's clear from Dr. Navio's work and others uh, that it's a hypometabolic disease where there's a large number of things that are very low. Uh, some of those things are the uh, raw materials that, that go into the mitochondria to generate energy. And that's what we think is the primary problem uh, in causing the fatigue. Is it still the case that the problem could also be not having enough of something in the blood that should be there? So uh, we've tested uh, serum uh, from patients that show a change in impedance. Uh, we don't know exactly what it is that causes that change. Uh, it could be something that's in the blood, that's a positive thing that causes it, or in fact, you're right, it could be something that's deficient. Now, one of the likely cases is the fact that it might be a metabolite or several metabolites because this is a hypometabolic disease. So we have done another experiment where we have actually filtered uh, the serum to see whether the signal is uh, in the material that goes through the filter or something that's retained. These filters are filtering out uh, molecular species. And what we found is that most of the signal is filtered out, which means it's fairly large, meaning it's probably a protein. Uh, if it were a metabolite, we would have probably have seen the filtrate causing the problem, which we did not. Would blood from patients suffering from other forms of chronic fatigue also show a similar impedance signature? Or is the MECFS signature unique and distinguishable from other kinds of fatigue and therefore viable as an unambiguous diagnostic for MECFS? Well, we haven't done enough tests at the moment to understand that. Uh, we will look at, at a number of fatigue situations, uh, other diseases that show fatigue, as well as uh, sports fatigue, and see if we see similar signals. Uh, it, this, this signature can still be quite useful if it in fact shows up in all different types of fatigue. We would then have to work out some way to distinguish the types of fatigue. And uh, one way to do that distinguishing is to look at uh, chemical reagents that will change the signal. And if, if uh, for example, the pyruvate that we've used and causing the signal to go away, um, we would look at whether the signal goes away in these other fatigue. So this gives us a lot of dimensionality to actually uh, develop a fairly complex test that may be very specific for chronic fatigue syndrome. I've been ill with MECFS for almost 40 years and I'm now 73 years old. Will you be able to help us oldies? Well, I'm very sad to hear that. Um, my guess is that it's a fundamental uh, process uh, that's wrong in patients and that if we come up with some way to reset the body it will work on no matter what the age or how long you've had it. Uh, we do think that maybe the disease has changes with time and so we'll have to be very careful to look at that when we do testing to test people with uh, that have had it for different lengths of time. Are you able to say anything about the involvement of the enzyme mTOR or the complex mTOR C1 and the disease? Well, this is a very interesting question. We have found two patients, and we haven't looked at that many, that have a mutation in mTOR. Uh, 
the mutation that we have found is fairly rare in the population according to the literature. So this is uh, a little odd and that would imply that mTOR is an important part of establishing uh, this disease. Uh, one reason why that's actually important it, it'd be that you don't want to take something that inhibits mTOR. And there are a number of drugs out there that are used for other purposes that are inhibitor for mTOR. Uh, and this may actually cause you to get chronic fatigue syndrome or in fact might make it worse. Um, some of the antibiotics are, are, are drugs that will inhibit mTOR. And so that could actually be making you worse uh, by taking an antibiotic that you think is actually curing you of an infection. That's why I've often said it's very, very important to know that you have an infection before you try antibiotics. How effective would pyruvate be either to ingest or to drip through a line? What sort of volume would be necessary? Is there a reason it wouldn't be practical at all? I said in the video that we've tried adding pyruvate to our assay and it makes the cells normal. Now what we don't know is, is it making it normal because it's now a food, a, a fuel supply that's bypassing a block? Or in fact, is it something, is the pyruvate blocking the blocker, so to speak? We don't know the answer to that. So the problem with pyruvate is the fact that one, it's not very soluble. So to take it as a, like a pill, uh, it won't be absorbed very well, and you can't take very much. If you take a lot, it will go into the lower intestine and cause bacteria to grow and could cause a great deal of discomfort. If you use it as an IV, uh, you will also have to be careful not to o uh, overdo it. Now, the other problem with it is that it's likely to be converted to lactate, and lactate actually may cause more problems. So it's not obvious that pruvate is something that we should be trying at the moment. Uh, that is something that will be tried out in some kind of modeling system and, and to see whether or not it could potentially be a useful drug. My bet though is we can find something else uh, that will actually block it more effectively than pruvate. Does anyone think it probable that an existing drug will cure MECFS? Will it be possible to take a guess at a personalized cocktail of substances for a patient and test that for a particular patient with the chip? What is the difference between finding a cocktail that replenishes what's missing versus turning the key, as Dr. Navio has discussed? Uh, Robert Navio has suggested that this is a cell danger response uh, in the body and that it's a metabolic state that is designed to protect the organism. And he believes that we should be able to find something that will turn it back on. And uh, I think that's highly likely that that's what's going on with this disease, given everything that we've done. And we certainly have not found anything that's inconsistent with that. Uh, I think that's what we want to look for as a drug. Uh, it's likely that a single drug will work. Uh, it could be, though, that we have to use combinations of drugs. That's easily tested on our device if, that, if, if we, we get to that point. Uh, so I'm optimistic that we can find something. Uh, I don't think it's likely to be a cocktail of, of, uh, of different nutrients. Uh, that's what a lot of people have tried. It hasn't really worked. Uh, I think it's going to be a drug and possibly a very surprising drug that nobody would ever occur to them that it would actually work. If this process is a protective mechanism, could it be a bad thing to turn it off? I don't think so. I, I don't think it would be a bad to turn it, turn it off. Uh, I think that would be the natural course that it is designed to come on to protect the individual and then should in fact reset and go back on. That should be the natural pathway. Uh, something is happening that prevents that from, from happening and uh, that would also be something that we should be trying to explore. Uh, 
it's possible, at least it's just a, this is a hypothesis that I have, um, that we have been trained uh, socially to always push through things. And you certainly see an awful lot of athletes uh, and, and, uh, that are, have this disease that were extremely active and they've learned to push through when they get tired. It's possible that this mentality of pushing through, which causes crashes, it, is what keeps people in this. And it, it naturally would uh, change and, and they would be reset and go back to normal. Now we've certainly seen cases where, uh, like a viral infection, where people are quite sick for some time and then they recover. It's possible that that's the normal mechanism and they've rested and then they've recovered. And it's because they try to push uh, through that illness and too early. And uh, that's what has caused them to continue to have the disease. In other words, the, the crashing actually reinitiates the disease over and over again. And that's what keeps them in it for years after year. How soon do you expect to start testing treatments using the assay you have developed? How long? Do you expect it will take you to test all currently existing drugs and compounds using your assay? Do you and your team have certain drugs or classes of drugs that you feel are particularly promising that you will test first? I'm not asking what they are, more just asking if you've got a good idea about what might work. How likely do you think it is that your assay will uncover currently existing drug that eventually turns out to be safe and effective in ME-CFS? Uh, well, an example of this is that we've, we've tested all of the uh, FDA-approved drugs in yeast. Uh, we've also have a drug that affects every gene in the genome of the yeast uh, organism. There's 6,000 genes, and we found a drug for all 6,000 genes. Uh, so some of this, when you have it in vitro acid, can be very fast. The other thing to keep in mind, um, at least initially, that uh, a drug may be designed for a specific target, but in fact it probably interacts with a number of other things. If you use the drug at high, higher concentration, you will get the secondary and tertiary effects. For example, rituximab is, a, um, is an antibody that destroys B cells. But it's possible that it interacts with other things. And that, that can be seen more clearly if you use it at a high concentration. So when we do these screens, we're going to do them uh, not at a low concentration that is generally prescribed for that drug. We will also look at it at higher concentration. It's possible that we can find something that will work at high concentration, uh, but not be the target that the drug was originally developed for. Now, at these high concentrations, there'll be side effects, but as Dr. Navio explains, uh, it's possible that all we need to do is to, to trigger the, uh, the body to go back to normal, and in fact, so the side effects uh, may not be so bad. Uh, it's, this is not a drug that you would probably have to take uh, year after year. It may be a single dose will cure you. How do your recent research findings fit in with Dr. Navio's cell danger response hypothesis? Well, we're looking at very different things. Um, he's been characterizing uh, the metabolomics that occurs in a, a person who has this disease. That's extremely valuable to understand all the complexities of that and, in fact, has found a, a unique signature. Uh, we're trying to go back to look at what is sort of the primary effects that cause the illness, and, and that's a bit different. And so there's nothing that we're doing that is inconsistent with what Norman Navio is doing. In fact, uh, it fits very well together with what he is doing. How much more money do you need to keep this research going rapidly? Uh, given my experience in, in the Human Genome Project uh, and trying to develop technologies for that, uh, I need about $5 million to keep it going at, at a good clip. And I need that a co commitment for $5 million uh, for, uh, uh, for each year. And I need a commitment for multiple years. If we were going to recruit a very skilled postdoctoral fellow or other scientist, 
they want to know that they have a job for a, a for several years. Uh, e even if we can make great advances faster than that, we won't get the right people unless we can make a long-term commitment to people. So that's why I've said we need about $5 million. We could probably use more, but that is uh, a, a level that I know that I can set up a very good team. This is a complex problem. It's a systemic disease. We need experts in a lot of different fields working together. Some of that can be achieved by coordinating with other laboratories, which of course we are doing, but it's, uh, it's also extremely useful to have everybody work together on a daily basis. Thank you very much.